we've got Johnny here today um, to talk about um, ACS and myocardial injury, and then Ken's house staff meeting will be after. So um, yeah, Johnny, go ahead and get started. Cool. Um, hello out there. It's good to see some faces in Zoom land. And um, this talk, so I, I'm, I, some of you may have seen this. I've done a version of this in different settings. I've changed a few things up, um, but it's not going to require I, my usual shtick of having you guys annotate a ton of stuff on the slide. So um, feel free to like interrupt with questions in the chat. If things come up, uh, we can pause for discussion, but I'm just going to sort of go through a little bit about ACS. Most of that should be review. Um, but mostly I want to focus on myocardial injury in the absence of an acute chest uh, pain syndrome. And uh, some of you put this on your problem list, hashtag troponemia. I'm going to sort of give you some better language to talk about it, uh, sort of hopefully erase that from your problem list and, and maybe even convince you to stop saying type 2 and STEMI. So I have nothing to disclose um, other than that I'm not a cardiologist yet, uh, but this is something that is very interesting to me that has changed over the last four years. Uh, and just again, the learning objectives for this talk, um, really quick, and we can spend more time if, if questions come up, but talk a little bit about the diagnosis and management of acute coronary syndrome, still a very important thing to reemphasize that that's still the bedrock use of troponin in the evaluation of a patient who's coming in with symptoms consistent with uh, acute coronary obstruction. But then talk about this fourth universal definition of myocardial injury and myocardial infarction and provide a clinical framework for the assessment of somebody who has myocardial injury in clinical practice, but doesn't actually fall into that ACS pathway. So hopefully that'll be useful. And those are the three things you'll walk away with. We're going to start again with just ACS. And so to start off a little bit of historical context, because I think it's important, names in medicine are often very confusing. And so it's a little helpful to think about how we got here. And there's sort of two stories that happened at the same time. The one story was a story sort of of pathology, studying things at autopsy. Let's look, that's where the name myocardial infarction came from. So it actually was first called coronary thrombosis. In 1878, there was a uh, landmark sort of paper that was published and they thought coronary thrombosis was correlated in autopsy with myocardial necrosis, which seems like a duh to us now where we're sitting, but at the time, a really big discovery. And actually, sort of over 50 years later in JAMA, they started to notice that there was areas of myocardial necrosis or infarction that didn't have have any associated coronary artery occlusion. And so they actually reverted back and stopped calling it coronary thrombosis and started calling it this, this term that we now use, acute myocardial infarction. It sort of is a nice precursor to what we're going to talk about, which is that not all things that hurt heart are indeed coronary thrombosis, but the big thing that we care about is uh, atherothrombosis. And so as we sort of went from diagnosing this in patients who were dead at autopsy, we wanted to try and diagnose this in people who were still living so we could design and, and test interventions. And that's where the definitions came up that uh, we're using now in clinical practice for myocardial infarction that incorporate ECG findings and biomarkers. But at the same time, we were thinking about a clinical syndrome, sort of the old timey doc who's seeing a bunch of patients that all came in with very similar stories and trying to piece that together based on what uh, ultimately happens to them later, you know, through autopsy, that's where this clinical features of sudden occlusion of the coronary arteries was first described. And that's 1912 in, in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And then we started to, to develop these technologies like ECG to try and understand temporal changes in the myocardium during ischemia. And so later we started to incorporate 12 lead ECGs that have been standardized into this clinical definition. And, and uh, actually the first biomarker was AST. And you can still see this be elevated in severe myocardial infarction. Uh, but it took to the 90s and gener uh, the first generation of specific cardiac biomarkers, namely the troponins, before we sort of incorporated all these things together into our clinical working term, acute coronary syndrome. And so a slide you've all seen before at some form or other in medical school, the pathophysiology of atherosclerosis is such that you're born with normal arteries here in one. Can you see my cursor? I'm not even sure if you can. You can. Aha. Okay, good. You start in one. Uh, you've got normal arteries, you get some cholesterol, you're eating too much bacon, it all of a sudden, these little LDL particles are, st are starting to deposit actually in the, in the subintimal layer of your, of your artery. And then macrophages come and they start eating that up and they develop into sort of an inflammatory milieu here. This is the plaque that we're all so used to. And this is what happens to some people, but not all people. 
they have a thin layer between that inflammatory milieu and what's going on inside of the vessel. And if that layer sort of erodes such that there's an erosion or a rupture of the internal contents of this plaque, then a thrombosis develops. And that acute occlusion is what an acute coronary syndrome seeks to identify. People that have a life-threatening immediate it an emerging cessation of blood flow to their heart that's going to result in heart death. But what you're trying to do when you're intervening is just get them to step six, which is stable coronary plaque with a nice calcified covering that's never going to let any of that bad stuff into the bloodstream again. So, right, we're trying to identify people in, in, in this phase five, and we're trying to support them and reverse any sort of blockage such that they then get through to that step six. And so what is an acute coronary syndrome? Finally, we're going to get to the definition. It's a useful operational term that refers to a spectrum of conditions, basically any set of symptoms and signs that is due to, or that appears to be due to an abrupt reduction in coronary blood flow. So it's purposely kind of vague, and we'll get into this. And the key thing, this is from the ACCHA guidelines, abnormalities on the ECG and elevated troponin in isolation don't make a diagnosis of ACS. So ACS is a story. It's a story you're telling yourself that says, I'm worried there's an abrupt cessation in coronary blood flow. And that's resulting in a set of symptoms that I know and that I've learned is identifiable and is consistent with that. And so uh, I think a lot of us were taught in med school, there's three distinct presentations of ACS. And these are very different buckets of people one comes in with unstable angina, another comes in with n STEMI, and the most frightening variety is STEMI. And I, I kind of want to uh, uh, modify that a little bit and say this is a spectrum of one presentation. Everyone who has ACS has unstable angina. They all came in with symptoms or signs. We just kind of went over that. You don't get it for biomarkers or ECG changes alone. But uh, if as you progress, and my terrible drawing here in PowerPoint is the blood vessel, and then that's that plaque, and then this was the previous area of blood flow, and here this is thrombosis. As you progress from subtotal occlusion to total occlusion with thrombus, you develop biomarker positivity with time. And if you have transmural infarct, then you get the most concerning features on ECG, namely ST elevation criteria. And so what we're doing actually is we're trying to identify everyone with an acute coronary syndrome, and you're watching people progress with time uh, if without therapy through the natural history of this, which is from unstable angina to STEMI, if they do indeed propagate said clot. Um, and so, uh, you know, I want to sort of emphasize the symptoms are the key sort of base of this pyramid. Did that make sense? Any questions? I should, I'm going to open the chat just to make sure stuff's not coming through. Emily, will you like flag me if stuff's coming? All right, cool. Um, so, so starting with the symptoms, you guys know all this, so I'm going to move pretty quickly, but the angina pectoris, what is unstable angina? It's Latin for chest pain, go figure, but it's not all types of chest pain, as you know, it's more diffuse, it's anywhere between the epigastrum and the mandible, and part of this is, is a visceral pain syndrome, right? So you guys have somatic innervation to your chest wall. If I punch you in the chest, you know where that hurts. It's a very very specific and localizing pain, but your viscera has very confusing nervous innervation and it doesn't actually know where the pain should be experienced. By the time it gets to your brain, it's interpreted on the level of the spine that these nerves are inserting at. And that's why, you know, phrenic nerve radiates to the shoulder. We all know that pretty well, but it turns out different areas of the heart may have different visceral innervation. And so those pain syndromes are very nebulous and they may be very challenging to describe. And that's why you hear radiation to the jaw, because that's still in a cervical spine region, or it can also be epigastric pain, and then really anything between the belt and the jaw is fair game. And we've been taught, I think, through many, many years, the typical presentation for Western men in particular, but it turns out that um, you know, the reason why I think a lot of people suggest that women may present with atypical or silent ischemia is namely because we haven't taught the illness script well enough for all the different ways in which other folks with different anatomy or pa patients with different cultures may describe that pain. So the classic elephant on the chest is definitely true here in the West. But what if you don't know what an elephant is? You might not describe it that way. In East Africa, I saw a lot of patients presenting with heartburn and uh, Uganda and Tanzania, they really sort of pointed up and down this tube. I don't know that that was regional, super regional to the area around Lake Victoria that I was, but it was something that I just noticed. This is a syndrome and it's very hard to describe and people use what they know 
and uh, I, maybe you've never had something heavy sitting on your chest, so you're not going to describe it that way. You're going to describe it differently. But the key is there's a certain set of things that it's not. It's not sharp. It's not knife-like. It's not electric. And it's not going to be in a small specific point. That's more likely to be somatic in nature or a neuralgia than something that's a visceral pain syndrome. And in particular, the pattern is helpful. If it's progressive and exertional, you all know this gradual onset and offset with rest, not pleuritic, positional, immediate peak on off. Those are things that would be highly suggestive in alternative diagnosis. If people have had angina, they know what it feels like. You can always ask the patient who is an expert in their own disease. Hey, you had a heart attack a year ago. Does this feel kind of similar? And if they say yes, be worried. You all know this. Okay, great. Anginal equivalents refer to those things which are uh, maybe the way in which somebody's experiencing their ischemia that isn't actually identifiable as pain. And in particular, dyspnea, I want to point out is the most common, but there's other associated symptoms that can happen like nausea, diaphoresis, and even subtle fatigue might be enough for somebody to get a stress test because that can be their anginal equivalent. And in particular, folks with diabetes, they develop neuropathy and so they don't have great innervation and so they may not have pain receptors maintained in the viscera and that's why they sometimes just have anginal equivalents. Exam findings, not helpful, but I recently just bruised a rib and if you poke me there, it hurts. That's probably the most helpful thing. If it's an MSK issue and you poke on it and it feels exactly the same pain that they're coming in with, that may be somewhat reassuring. I think a lot of people want to use response to treatment as an evidence of uh, pathology, but the problem is that in any study you look at, it's not strongly associated. It turns out a lot of things that have to do with the esophagus respond to nitroglycerin, and also sometimes temporally people's chest pain just resolves a little bit, even if it's not because of the GI cocktail, but it's at the same time that you gave it to them. So you really shouldn't rely on response to treatment. It's not super helpful. So the bottom line is angina is tough, but you have to have a high index of suspicion. Anything between the belt and the chin is fair game. If it's progressive, it's exertional, it doesn't have any of those things that make it sound more like a somatic pain syndrome, then you should at least do an evaluation for ACS. And so uh, the, the last part of this is what is ACS? Well, it's not just angina pectoris, right? We, we talked about typical angina and stress testing. This, this is acutely unstable. And this, this is the acute component of an acute coronary syndrome. And so how do you define that? If the time course is less than two weeks, they haven't yet completed their infarct. These are the people we want to identify. If it's been going on for months, well, even if it was an acute thrombosis, it's unfortunate, but we can't really do much to reverse that damage at this point. And so sometimes people have unstable coronary syndromes, meaning it's getting worse, but it's beyond that two week point. Those are not folks that need admission to the hospital and, and management and emergently, nor do they need that close monitoring. The definition of unstable angina requires that it's either rest angina that's new or that it's new onset angina with which markedly limits ordinary activity. This is a useful caveat. If you see somebody in clinic, I have seen someone in clinic who swims 35 laps a day in the pool and they say now with 30 laps or 25 laps, I have to stop because I get a little bit of chest tightness. I am worried that person's developing coronary artery disease, but I don't think they're in that stage five. I don't think they have an acute thrombosis because they're still doing the majority of their day's work with no impediment. They are only noticing this because they're a high performance athlete and that patient had stable coronary disease and just needed medical management and didn't need to be sent to the ER. Okay, so thinking about a patient in terms of a spectrum of presentation, how far along has their clot propagated helps you when you think about management, because we sort of, everyone gets stabilization of that plaque, but we sort of want to try to reduce ischemia if it's mild and we think we can just sort of to help let them have some time to dissolve that clot on their own. And in patients with total and complete thrombosis that's now complete occlusion, we need to restore perfusion right away. And that means, right, revascularization or thrombolytics. And so I don't like Mona B. I think a lot of people have learned that. It starts with the things that we don't care about anymore. Somebody suggested we should call it cash for clobidogrel, aspirin, statin, and heparin. That might be actually better if you must have a mnemonic. But I just really think about it in terms of principles because these drugs may change with time. And it's antiplatelet therapy, always aspirin, baby aspirin's great, give them four, you need a full dose and have them chew it, don't ever give them enteric coated, you want its onset to be quick, and then usually, and I think we underdo this, but you want a, se a second agent, and that could be ticagrelor, 
in, in many settings, it should be ticagrelor, or, but it often is clopidogrel and that's fine too. Anticoagulation with heparin is often what we reach for because we think they may need an intervention and it's easier for interventionalists to go because they use heparin in the cath lab in if you're on heparin. But I just want you to know the data for low molecular weight heparin is great. And also bivalrudin's fine if they have hit. A low molecular rate heparin has a quicker onset. You guys all know the heparin drip is never in goal. And so it actually may be more effective um, and, and has less bleeding risk in patients that aren't going to get an actual procedure. If you really know that's not going to be the case, but rarely we do. Nitrates are good. Titrate to chest pain. You know the contraindication if they have posterior MI. If you're worried about right heart failure, then you should, you know, if they bottom out in their blood pressure, try not to give it. That's fair. Beta blocker is less and less in vogue. Um, and rarely, if ever, a calcium ca channel blocker. This is less straightforward and probably beyond the, this, this part of the talk, but you guys have heard about this. We're using less beta blockers, especially because if somebody has early signs of heart failure, you may precipitate sort of worsening heart failure, cardiogenic shock. And supportive care, I say that because oxygen and morphine used to be in the mnemonic, and you don't need to oxygenate people who are oxygenating themselves on ambient air just fine. There is some retrospective data that showed signal for harm at one point, but in any case, it's a, at the very least, it's not helpful to slap oxygen on somebody who's statting above 94% without any oxygen. Morphine is palliative. There used to be legends tell of the vasodilatory effect of morphine in the coronary arteries. It's really uh, it's not a thing. People die more when they get morphine, it turns out, and that's probably signal more that their chest pain is unremitting than anything. Um, and so palliate their chest pain if they're in pain, uh, for sure, but don't reach for morphine as, an, as a must give in these situations. Okay, you all probably knew all that. The main thing people wonder about is who gets reperfusion versus medical therapy alone in the absence. So, okay, who gets reperfusion? I should say STEMI obviously gets these reperfusion, no questions asked. Serial ECGs are important because like I said, it's a spectrum. Somebody could come in with unstable angina and before their troponin's even positive, develop ST elevation criteria. And so serial ECGs are often something we're, we're checking if somebody still has an ongoing chest pain despite nitro. Um, but if they have no ST elevation, we'll use a risk score. Pick, take your pick. They've all performed pretty much the same. I think race may be a little bit better, but requires more data. The ED is going to use a heart score, and then it's going to tell them to use a grace score if the heart score is above some threshold. And you all maybe learned Timmy in medical school because that was the most popular and probably the earliest to the scene. They all perform similarly. Um, again, we're going, we're just trying to identify who in step five needs reperfusion before they can get safely to step six. And it turns out when you put a stent in, you trade one disease for another. You trade the native coronary artery disease for the stent disease. Stents are prothrombotic. And uh, does anyone know what the drug is that's in the drug eluding scent? Put it in the chat. The chat is pretty quiet. Oh, no. Tacro Everlimus. Yeah, exactly. It's chemotherapy, not anticoagulant, because it turns out when you put a metal thing in a blood vessel, the blood vessel gets inflamed and it starts to develop arteriolar proliferation. And that leads to instant restenosis. So not only have you traded the acute procoagulant mess for a new acute procoagulant mess. But in the long run, you've traded stable coronary disease that's going to progress based on their LDL that we have great secondary prevention methods for arteriolar proliferation and re instant restenosis, a different disease that often leads to the worsening obstruction. And so you have to wonder, you know, should we put stents in everyone? And that's why there's often resistance to doing this because it's not a totally benign procedure, though it is life-saving in certain settings. As I said, STEMI 100% of the time should get a stent. Um, but yes, we used tacro or everolimus or serolimus. All these chemotherapies are actually to slow the growth of the blood vessel. And that's why drug eluting stents actually required at one point much longer uh, amounts of antiplatelet relative to a bare metal stent, which doesn't end up, which endothelializes really quickly and hides itself from the blood, but in doing so is really susceptible to instant restenosis. So reperfusion sort of, it is, is definitely indicated in STEMI. There's a couple other cases in which it's not been really studied through the use of this sort of risk score and, and risk calculator method. And so it should probably get immediately reperfused. And that's definitely in patients with ventricular arrhythmia or cardiogenic shock. Like we're not messing around trying to figure out if they, what their risk is. Like the risk is terrible. They're already dying in front of you. Get reperfusion for those patients if you think it's in the setting of ACS or if you know for sure it might be. Um, that's, a, that's an indication on its own. But also this, this is sort of comes up a lot. There's some sort of argument about this at 
times, but refractory chest pain is by maximal nitro. And it really depends on how likely you think this is to be uh, a non-ST elevation ACS episode. But most interventionalists are worried about that, that that means that, you know, even, even though they haven't developed ST elevation or we're not able to see it on R12 EDCG, they're not responding to maximal nitro. They're having ongoing heart death and that's bad. If they don't have one of those three things, what does a risk score calculator do for you? It takes into account how bad their presentation is, features of it, including symptoms, and namely the troponin elevation, and how bad of a patient they are in terms of losing a little heart. So if their substrate is poor and they're not going to tolerate losing a little heart, then maybe you should have a low threshold to go ahead and cath them in the next 12 to 24 hour. Also, if their troponin's a billion, you should cath. That's pretty scary. And so it's somewhere in the middle, maybe you cath them during this emission, but you're not in a rush to get there right away because you think your medical therapies are gonna suffice. They're gonna sort of stabilize the patient. You just wanna make sure it's not such a high risk lesion that it, if it were to get worse when you pull off the heparin, uh, it would be devastating like a proximal LAD or left main disease. And if they're the lowest risk category, then you don't necessarily need to cath them at all. Those are the patients that you can have expedited outpatient further risk stratification with non-invasive tests. Okay. What about morphine oxygen? We talked about that. Okay, so to summarize, you see a patient, they have the sort of typical symptoms of chest pain. You go, oh, that's acute coronary syndrome. You get an EKG, you're looking for STEMI, you're starting medical therapy. You're gonna check some labs because you wanna know how do I risk stratify this patient? And you, if, if you see the labs are positive for, you know, the troponin's elevated, then you're gonna call it a myocardial infarction. You guys already knew that. And if there's ST elevation, you're already calling it STEMI. But if it wasn't ST elevation, you're calling it N STEMI. This is sort of the classic thing that's taught. But I think something you see a lot, and especially you are threes who've done Harborview cards, somebody checked the labs first. They saw an elevated troponin and they're calling you because they're like, ah, the troponin's high. And then you look at the patient and they look like this guy. And you're like, what? What do I call that? And so enter the fourth definition, which, which kind of defines this new category of myocardial injury. Okay, one more time, we're gonna go to history. So we talked about the epidemiologic approach. This is why we called myocardial infarction. And this is part of that sort of response to new technologies. Every time there was a new technology, they got a new definition. And what is the new technology we're responding to? It turns out it's, it's these fifth generation or high sensitivity troponin assays. I can measure a troponin level in Emily and Caitlin and Alice and all the faces I can see right now, Jenna and Hermaeus and Sarah and Will. So that's great. I can measure troponin in everybody. And so now I need to know what to do with that <laughs> when it is elevated, but not meaningfully so, or not a part of the clinical syndrome we were seeking to describe in the first place, that acute coronary syndrome due to thrombosis. And so that's what this response is. And so myocardial injury is detection of an elevated, right? Everyone has troponin in the blood. So troponinemia doesn't matter anymore. It's not on the problem list. Detection of an elevated cardiac troponin above the 99th percentile, above what is called the upper limit of normal in your reference range, that's a myocardial injury. And we call it acute if there's a rise or fall of greater than 20% on serial assessment. And so why? Because if I just graph this, some people have chronic myocardial injury, right? We call it chronic if it doesn't rise or fall. And they're just gonna sit with a troponin that's elevated above that 99th percentile forever and ever, but it's kind of flat line or maybe wavers a little bit. You've seen these patients with ESRD, they have a little bit of trope. It's okay. It's not a sign of an, an acute insult necessarily, but if you catch it rising, if you were sampling early, then you think, okay, there was an acute event and it, it's either ongoing or I just, I just got it right after it. Or if you're catching it late, it's on its way down. That means they had an acute event and you're seeing it later. So that's why you look for that rise and fall. Does that make sense? Cool. So when do we call it myocardial infarction? If you have myocardial injury and you suspect it's due to ischemia, you get to call it infarction. So what do you suspect it's ischemia? Well, they have ACS, still call it an MI, myocardial infarction, because you're already in the setting of ACS. You're already having symptoms of angina. You can look for ECG changes alone and still call it myocardial infarction. You might not call it ACS in that situation, but if you have very sort of pathognomonic findings like new ST segment elevation or depression or T wave changes, and this feels consistent, uh, development of pathologic Q wave certainly would, would suggest myocardial infarction. And most importantly, imaging. So they've lost a viable myocardium by some modality, wall motion abnormalities that fit with a vascular distribution. You're going to call this infarction more likely. Um, you know, this is a clinical diagnosis still until you've confirmed it, but that's, that's sort of how we work with it. If you're saying injury, you're saying it's still very undifferentiated or you're saying it's not infarction. Okay. Everyone wants to talk about type one and type two. 
Type one is the thing that we've been talking about that we care a lot about because we have tools in our tool shed that really help these people survive. Type two is a variety of things and it's basically everything else that leads to a myocardial infarction. So if it's ischemia, if there's still impaired oxygen delivery, the coronary artery might be normal and that patient may be in respiratory shock. They may be in shock or respiratory failure. They have impaired oxygen delivery. They may be bleeding. They have anemia. These are all reasons why you could not perfuse your heart. And that's really bad. And that may lead to troponin elevation. You guys know this intuitively. They could have non-atherosclerotic coronary disease. So they could have SCAD or spontaneous coronary artery dissection. Um, we see that sort of the textbook thing is somebody is, um, ha it's usually a younger woman, peri-pregnancy because something to do with estrogen can sometimes lead to this. But there's a lot of uh, rheumatologic conditions that are associated with the development of spontaneous coronary artery dissection as well. Vasospasm is something that gets talked about, or you could have stable coronary disease and be in sepsis <laughs> and you would get a troponin leak. Um, and so we'll talk about this a little bit more. There's other types beyond two, ignore them. They're for like your interventionalists, your surgeons. It's more for epidemiology and like sort of, did you hurt them in surgery or did you just tinker around in their heart as a cardiac surgeon? Okay, so putting it all together, you've got this big bucket of myocardial injury. That means you've got an upper limit of normal. It's, it's acute and it's cute. We're gonna talk about acute myocardial injury mostly. Within that bucket, you have some folks who you think that's due to a lack of perfusion. You're going to call that infarction. And if you think they have atherosclerosis that ruptured or eroded and led to a thrombus, then that's type one. So that's over here. That's your type two. And everyone calls it demand MI. It turns out every MI is a demand MI. It's always demand and supply mismatch. But yes, it's type two. It's not the thing we cared about when we talked about stents. Type one. Great. Acute coronary syndrome comes at it from a different angle. We're starting from symptoms. So sometimes you get people that don't yet have myocardial injury. That's unstable angina. But you also have people who don't fall into acute coronary syndrome that do have that type 1 MI. And that's the silent infarct we're all sort of nervous about missing. And of course, STEMI can sort of overlap with all of these. You can have SCAD that falls into STEMI, um, but it's still not a type 1 MI. Okay, so wait, who cares? Why am I talking so much about this? Okay, I'm gonna just give you a quick plug for why I care. So there was some really great epidemiologic studies that showed that folks who had in hospital troponin elevations were diagnosed with type one MI and had treatment for them. They had better long-term outcomes than those who had type two MI or myocardial injury. I'm gonna let that sink in for a second. So the thing we're most scared about is atherothrombosis oh my God, acute coronary occlusion due to thrombus. But we're very good at identifying those patients and treating them. And we then immediately go, type two MI is on my problem list, AKA don't care, don't care. And those patients do very poorly. When you substratify those patients by type two MI with coronary disease and type two MI not related to coronary disease, you start to see a trend that folks with type two MI who have coronary disease they die more, not of other causes, not of competing death, but of cardiovascular death, major adverse cardiovascular events than folks who had real bona fide heart attacks. What does that tell me? I want you to care about heart disease. Type 1 MI definitely requires prompt intervention to prevent in-hospital loss of life, but type 2 MI and, type, and myocardial injury have worse long-term prognosis are very important to consider and think about. And differentiating between infarct and injury, is this somebody with coronary disease? Helps you think about future cardiovascular risk. Actually, what I think is going on is that we are under treating with secondary prevention in patients who need it because we're not thinking about them and that incident event that shows that they have underlying coronary disease, that there's an intervention that we actually have that would help them not come back with a heart attack, even though this time they came in with a pneumonia. Okay, so recap, you got myocardial injury, you look at the patient, they have chest pain, you call you a myocardial infarction, you go, okay, this is ACS pathway again, let's go down that route, but you have that myocardial injury patient who doesn't look like they have chest pain and it's still myocardial injury. And so what's my approach? That's what we're going to talk about. Acute myocardial injury is the AKI of the heart. So I'm going to borrow the framework you already have in your brain. And we're going to do an anatomic framework. So there's pre-coronary causes. This is impaired oxygen delivery. Even before you got to the coronary artery, if you didn't have enough blood in your, in your system, if you have hypovolemic shock, 
of course you're gonna develop a myocardial injury, but it's not intrinsic to your heart. You might have hypoxemia and respiratory failure. We talked about that pulmonary embolism or aortic, aortic stenosis can sort of, before it even gets into the coronary artery, it can prevent blood from getting there. So these are all sort of pre-coronary etiologies and elevated troponin or acute myocardial injury. Okay. Intracoronary pathology, just like intrinsic kidney disease is what we really worry about. And there's two types. We talked about it, type one MI, and there's other things that can happen in the artery that aren't atherothrombosis. Still important to think about, um, but you know, we're trying to, we're really trying to emphasize that we would need to act right away on that type one MI, but we want to understand what's going on in the coronary arteries as well. And then post-coronary is direct injury to the myocardium, physical injury, Inflammation, you, you all have seen myocarditis. Pericarditis doesn't do this, so it must be perimyocarditis, right? Troponin doesn't exist in the pericardial cells, it's in the muscle cells. While stretch and stress can do this alone, extremes of hypertension, of decompensation and volume overload can lead to more leakage of troponin. And tachycardias, even in the absence of decrease in blood flow, can result in this as well. Excessive catecholines, you've seen this, stress cardiomyopathies, also patients with strokes or other cerebrovascular accidents, they, they have a lot of catecholamines and that sort of leads to troponin elevation. We can call that cerebral. Uh, you've seen cerebral T waves maybe on some ECGs and changes like that. Uh, and direct toxins can do this as well. And so a uh, funny story about this. Um, I got called on Harborview Cardiology for code STEMI in the night to like one of the surgical floors. And I'm running over there. I'm on the phone with the interventionist. He's like, oh, can you, take the, uh, can, you, can you take a picture of the ECG and send it over? And I'm like, oh, this looks like real ST elevation. And then I walk into the room and the patient has a big bandage over their left chest. So I asked the resident, I said, uh, why does the patient have a huge bandage on their left chest? And they're like, oh, he got shot in the left chest. He got shot in the left chest. Of course he has chest pain. Does this hurt more than when you got shot? Is this different? Is this new? Oh no, it's been hurting for two days. The troponin is 22 though. Well, yeah, he got shot in his heart. He got shot right next to his heart and all the trauma that, so direct myocardial injury is something that seems so obvious, but it's actually not in a lot of people's differential because to them and, and to many doctors, a troponin is specific, not for injury to the heart, but actually for ACS. And that's not actually true, right? So if we're gonna check high sensitive troponins, we gotta think of it like creatinine. It goes up sometimes and it doesn't mean the heart itself is to blame. Okay, so now sort of operationalizing that. So you see a patient with myocardial injury and they're not an ACS patient. They don't have symptoms. You're trending the troponin. Oh wait, actually you're gonna double check for yourself. They don't have angina. You're gonna look at an ECG yourself and make sure there's not hyperacute changes like SD elevation that would push you to go down the ACS algorithm. But just, the, okay, sorry, going back a second. You're trending the troponin. If you see chronic myocardial injury, there's, not that many things that can do this. It's, it's maybe they have end-stage renal disease. Maybe they have existing structural heart disease like hypertrophs. They could have infiltrative processes like sarcoid or amyloid that sort of can slow consistent leak or chronic inflammation like chronic myocarditis, somebody with dermatomyositis. Those tend to be small levels of troponin and they tend to stay sort of persistently elevated with time. Um, interesting thing about ESRD, even though they have chronic myocardial injury, I think a lot of people were taught that's because they don't clear and that's not necessarily the case. Their curves look exactly the same in acute injury as somebody without ESRD. So the troponin that comes out during an acute event doesn't stick around any longer. So it's likely not anything to do with clearance and more to do with the fact that they have all the bad humors they're not filtering and those toxins are leading to injury and or the small and sort of persistent levels of volume overload in the setting of them not managing their own volume very well. Okay, you see it's acute, it's got a rise or a fall. What are you gonna do? You're gonna get an echo. If you see global dysfunction or it looks globally normal, then you're gonna go to pre or post coronary. It's something that's affecting the whole heart. So it's not gonna be a single coronary artery. If you see a focal abnormality, you gotta ask yourself, does this make sense with a vascular distribution? Because if it doesn't, then you're thinking about a focal and direct injury, something like acute myocarditis or contusion trauma. Sometimes, some variants of Takotsubo don't, don't have vascular overlap and aren't global. If it does have a vascular distribution, okay, so you're still in sort of a bad zone. Now you, now you really owe it to yourself to consider whether you can, and, and if you can, you should get angiography because you need to evaluate what's going on on the level of the coronaries. And if you see an acute occlusion, you did it. You found the silent type one MI, thank goodness for you. Other things can happen in the coronaries as well. You'll identify those that way. You may find stable coronary disease, not an acute occlusion with thrombus, 
but they have stable calcified plaque. And if you do, they failed their stress tests. <laughs> Treat them like they failed their stress test. Start them on a statin. Think about whether they should be on a secondary prevention as aspirin, even though they didn't have an acute thrombus, um, because these patients um, probably had a, a global lack of supply um, or direct injury. And, what? Uh, and, uh, and that's what's resulted when superimposed on their stable coronary disease in a vascular distribution focal injury. And then if they don't have any obstruction, this is the clinical entity many of you have heard referred to as Minoka or myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries. I know it's a mouthful, Jenna. Uh, and it is, a, it, it's heterogeneous. And basically it means either go back to the drawing board or this was focal direct injury. It just happened to look like it was a vascular distribution or they have microvascular disease. So remember, angiography only evaluates the big juicy epicardial coronary arteries, the ones you can see. But many people have disease or could develop thrombus and sort of microvascular disease that wouldn't be evidence on your angi even though you can't necessarily go in and stent something. And then, uh, there's also some thoughts that folks may develop atherosclerosis differently. And when we look, we look for lumpy, bumpy disease, but some patients, and this is about 20, 10 to 20% of men and probably more like 40 to 50% of women. And so there's some thought that there may be a hormonal component to this, develop smooth luminal sort of like concentric atherosclerosis and the plaque may erode in any of those sites. And so you don't actually see the, the lumpy bumpy disease that you expect to see, but there is actually atherosclerosis that's been occurring over the course of their lifetime. It's just that it's not something that's gonna be super evident radiographically. A lot more, day, a lot, a lot more science needs to be done in this area to figure out how to treat these patients and how to further triage them. Most of the time, if you're really worried about this patient, a cardiac MRI is going to be better for trying to dis distinguish sort of post coronary causes from something that may actually be going on in the coronary artery. So I hope this is helpful and sort of walked you through, I think what you've all sort of learned from just picking up patterns, but like, it seems like the move is to get an echo. And it's like, we're getting an echo because we're trying to understand if this is a vascular distribution. If it is, then we really owe it to ourselves to look in the coronary. So again, in summary, operationalizing that, you're going to ask if this is ACS. And if it is, you're going to use that ACS pathway we talked about at the top of the, of the talk. But if not, start managing the competing non-coronary causes. If they're septic, make sure they're on antibiotics. Fluid resuscitate patients with hypovolemia. Make sure you reverse anemia if it's life-threatening. Of course, treat respiratory failure and shock. But you're gonna ask yourself, what's the likelihood of an intramural thrombus? You may plug them into that calculator just to get an assessment of, just say this was type one MI, well, would they be somebody who's gonna have a really bad outcome? And then you're gonna think about the risk of therapy. And this is why so often when you call your cardiology consult and you have your troponin elevation in this patient, they go, could we just give them aspirin? And you're like, yeah, we could, but I wanna know what's going on. Don't ask what's going on yet, just give them the aspirin it's going to be fine either way if there's no risk but it, you know if so i give you full permission to give patients aspirin with positive troponins and you're still sussing it out if you've done your thought and you're like there's really no reason not to give aspirin just go ahead and give it are they okay for a second antiplatelet and or heparin the reason you ask that is if not there's not really a role for stent if they're contraindicated from dapt and heparin it's going to be very hard to go in and replace the disease they have with the prothrombotic disease of a stent. Okay. And so that's an important thing to have thought about when you then talk to an interventionalist. And trending the troponin is helpful, not just because it helps you determine if this is an acute or a chronic process, but because the extent to which it rises and the rate at which it rises goes back into that likelihood or risk of intramural thrombus. The higher the troponin, I have a graveyard slide on this. Hang on. The higher the troponin, it, it really sort of helps you think about what the cause is. So if it's super high, it's very likely to be an acute myocardial infarction unless it's like a, just a huge area of myocarditis. And that's gonna push people to, to the cath, okay? So back to the, yep. You're gonna, you're gonna get an echo, just like we talked about. Uh, you're going to consider CT of the coronary arteries because it's a really nice way to avoid an uh, invasive procedure and still get an angiogram if somebody's stable for it. And you can beta block them and you might end up using cardiac MRI more in practice because they're getting cheaper and we're getting better at reading them. And then the fourth question I want you to ask, does this patient have chronic coronary atherosclerosis? Guess what? They just failed their stress test if their troponin is positive. 
and 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 think about when and just as soon as you can starting secondary prevention and talking to that patient about their future cardiovascular risk because now they should be just like all your outpatients who have positive stresses they should be thinking about any chest pain syndrome as suspect and they should have nitro available and they should be on they should be counseled on smoking cessation on good hypertensive medications and good blood sugar control okay that's my bit I have t some time for questions, I think. Five minutes. Thanks, John. Unmute, talk to me. I know that was a lot. Johnny, I feel like sometimes on cards I was nervous about giving DAPT because someone might need cabbage and then that's like delays their surgery. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but there's still some surgeons who are very upset. I think it really is unfortunately so center specific. Um, they've done studies and they show that the bleeding risk is not that much higher with DAPT. We've done our studies and we know that the worse, the, that end stemmies do better, not just stemmies with dual antiplatelet. And in particular, ticagrelor, is probably better because it has a faster onset and it's actually reversible, although we don't think about reversing it that often. Um, so I tend to push people to use medical therapy. We are medicine doctors, we have that bias. I think surgeons are nervous about bleeding complications and they're sewing tiny circles and tiny circles, right? They're doing cabbage, that's a really difficult procedure and they don't want bleeding if they can avoid it. That being said, my experience here is that it's very rare that someone gets emergent revascularization surgically. More often, if somebody has a culprit lesion, they get stented and, and if they really need the emergent revascularization or else we use medical therapy to temporize the clot and bridge them such that they could get a more comprehensive revascularization surgically. Does that make sense? So like, what you worry about is if you stent a lesion, you're going to steal flow from like the, the limit of the LAD is all you care about in cabbage. And if you stent an LAD, blood is going to continue to flow through the native artery and it's not going to go through the graft. And so the graft is going to clot off and collapse and you're going to lose the graft. And it's the graft that's going to save their life one day when they have another acute thrombotic event. And so if you can temporize them with medicine better, you actually better preserve the likelihood they'll make it long enough to that three, four day way to get into the OR to get a new limit of their LED. That's been my experience. There are other clinical sites where truly the CT surgeons take them to the OR and put that Lima on that LAD within hours in non ST elevation MI. And so it's like a meaningful alternative to a stent. And so in those cases, maybe they have an argument to say, hold the DAPT. My personal opinion, as a not yet cardiologist, James, is that we should be giving more DAP than we do. In your algorithm, um, when you, like the peak of the like X and Y axis of the troponin, are you saying like, like what, like, can you just give like an example? Cause I feel like that's where sometimes I get stuck where it's like, you know, a little bit and then it goes, you're like, well, like, is this actually like, do we need to work this out further? Do we just say this is like a type two, you know, like that, like, I, I feel like we do get stuck in that. Um, let me ask back the question to make sure I got it. Is your question, where is the threshold to be more worried? No, not even like, but just like the way that you have it drawn, like with the peak like that, I feel like. Like I wouldn't go to an echo. Like I would probably call to see if they need like any intervention. No, go down the X and Y. No, 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 go down. It's the one where you did like the, it, it was your own algorithm that you made right oh, there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 47. Like with a peak like that, I feel like, you know, I'm like thinking like it's like 0.4 to like seven. So I'm definitely, you know, I just feel like we're not doing an echo right away. Like I feel like we're doing more, you know? Ah, sorry. So because I drew, I drew, which I should, I should say, I didn't draw this because I got lazy. I borrowed this, and yes, it looks like a very severe rate of rise. And you're yeah. right that we maybe wouldn't be lollygagging with an echo, and we'd be going straight to the cath lab. Yeah. I, imagine this were from point zero three to point two. 
Yeah, like that's totally different. That's like, the that's okay. the echo person. Yeah, yeah. But okay, you're okay. right. That you're makes right. me feel better. Okay, because I a... was thinking like, whoa, like, what, like, like if I ordered an echo on this on like cards A, they'd be like, what the fuck? Oh, sorry, they'd be like, what the hell? You know, like, okay, sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, good, good clarifying point, Anna. That's important. So, um, what are your thoughts on when and what patients do you CTA coronary for? I I'm pretty bullish on CTAs of the coronary. I think they're really great. I think we're going to see more adoption of them. I think the ACCA and the AHA and their most recent guidelines were also fairly optimistic about them. I think they're very sensitive in the right clinical context, which is somebody who is not, you know, what are you going to get with a CTA of the coronaries? If you can slow their heart rate around down to like in the 60 to 80 range, you're going to get good resolution, like a PE type study angiogram. And that's helpful because you know what's going on in the coronary artery. What you're not going to get is the ability to stent it if you're super concerned it's a high risk lesion. So you shouldn't probably use it in those patients. But I think people are most optimistic about CTA coronary for sort of your ischemic eval and stable coronary disease or your patient who has a very kind of confusing chest pain syndrome in the ER and you want to get a quick picture. They're, they're sort of low enough risk that you would send them home. But if they were really having a plaque rupture event, you don't want to send them home, right? And that's where CTA coronary is helpful. And I think that there's also a use case uh, for patients with like heart failure um, who have low likelihood of, of having ischemic cardiomyopathy, but you sort of like want to do the ischemic eval. I think that's a good use case potentially for CTA coronary if they're safe to get a lot of beta blocker. And, um, and other, other times I, I reach for CTA coronary is like I said in this al algorithm, if they get imaging and their troponin is not super high and you, you think they're able to take IV contrast, but you don't really do like intra arterial contrast and put them through an invasive procedure that requires heparin, you might get your answer with the CTA and that might be good enough because the sensitivity is good. And so it's good of ruling out an intracoronary process. Brandon asks, given type two or acute myocardial injury has worse outcomes, this is retrospective outcomes than ACS, should we be aggressive about starting these patients on aspirin if there aren't any contraindications? Um, I wanna focus on the fact that those are, they have, so people with troponin elevations have worse in hospital outcomes than people without troponin elevations. That's obvious. Any organ dysfunction is bad and they're gonna do worse than somebody who doesn't have that. But I think the question you're asking is, I, actually I wanna know Brandon, is the question you're asking about secondary prevention of aspirin or are you meaning, should we be more aggressive about treating potential type one MIs that we've misdiagnosed as type two? And I'll just answer both. I, I don't know that there's been incredibly effective like randomized control trial of data to support the use of aspirin in, in folks with stable coronary disease that haven't had like a, a plaque rupture event. But I think most cardiologists would tend to put people on a baby aspirin um, because they are at elevated risk. And especially if they've already had troponin elevations in hospitals, um, they're probably even higher risk than those people we diagnose at, at lap 30 with angina and then decide, oh yeah, they have obstructive coronary disease that's of very minimal impact. So I, I personally think it's, if there's no contraindication that the baby aspirin, the, that there, we, we know that there is a relative risk reduction and that their absolute risk is high enough that that's a meaningful relative risk reduction when compared to the very small increased risk of bleeding in all comers at that, uh, that get aspirin. I hope that answered that question. Thank you so much, Johnny. I know that there are a couple other questions in the chat, but um, I think it's time for us to take a break. We'll make sure that your slides, if that's okay with you, are up and available to everyone. And then also we'll make sure that this recording is available for anybody to reference um, anytime. Um, so it's 9.50 now. Uh, let's have Let's have a 10 minute break and let's come back together at 10 a.m. And that'll be time for Ken's house staff meeting. And if you have pets or babies that you want to put on camera, feel free. <laughs> 